do today is I will, because of the internet issues, I will share the presentation from my screen and, uh, and I do, we'll, we'll talk to that. Okay, can everybody see that presentation? Okay, great. So over to you, Ida. You're muted at the moment. You're still muted. Oh, now? Sorry? No, yeah, that's good. Okay, sorry. No, I was just saying I'm sorry that my internet is not very good at the moment, <laughs> and that's why I uh, we have to do these settings. So hopefully that, that works for everybody. So uh, thanks for inviting me here today. And it's a pleasure to be back on a way because I was uh, briefly working at the uh, Ecosystems Lab uh, for a while. <laughs> so it's great to, to, to see you. I mean, I wish it was in person, but maybe next time. So I'm going to talk today about the unusually high biomass of tropical forests in the mountains of Africa. So when we think about tropical forests, and most of you work there in a way, we usually think about these huge trees, as you can see in the photo up there. And actually, um, in the mountains is a little bit different. And you can go to the next slide, please. And uh, in the mountains, the, the trees tend to be shorter because um, the environmental conditions. So it's more windy in the ridges. So there could be a uh, trip over in a way. That's called the temperature. So they grow slower. There's more fog and reduced light incidence. And usually, the fertility of the soil is also lower because of slower decomposition rates uh, related to both uh, water logging and on certain areas, but also the reduced temperatures. So we have in general, shorter trees, fewer of these extremely large emergent trees and tree diversity also decreases because of the challenging environmental conditions um, or the what we call the environmental filtering. But on the other side, we also have more uh, trees with multiple stems and it is believed that this is an adaptation to being broken by wind. So if one stem dies, the other one could take over. So the question is, is there more carbon in the, I mean, in the above ground biomass and not on the soils in a way, in the mountain forest or in the lowland forest? And uh, if we go to the next slide, please. So actually there was a review done in 2014 by Spraklin and Riolato, and uh, these authors put together plots from different sources and they kind of um, uh, run some stats on it, as you can see in this figure here. And what they found was that in both uh, the neotropics and Southeast Asia, there was more carbon in the lowlands than in the mountain forest. And there was no significant difference between the two continents. Uh, so the average you can see there is about 250 megagrams of biomass uh, per hectare. And this is different to the lowlands where there's more uh, carbon in the Southeast Asia compared to the neotropics. And they found no correlation with elevation, annual rainfall or temperature, which is also different from the lowland forest as the Sullivan paper shown for the pantropical. But these authors actually only managed to gather five plots from Africa, so they didn't run any stats on it. And then it's, uh, I work in the African continent, and then I ask this question. So I've been measuring some trees in the mountains of Africa. I know some other colleagues that have also been measuring trees. And, and that's how the idea came up of, can we compile these data sets and actually run a similar analysis for the African continent? And that's what we did. So the next slide, please. So we put up uh, together in a way we assembled uh, what we call the AFRIMONT plot database. And there's uh, 226 plots that range in um, size between 0 0.2 and 1.5 hectares. And they're located in 44 mountain sites in 12 countries. And also the elevation is quite varied from 800 meters elevation to three th over 3000. And it, it, we use kind of standard protocols. Um, we measure all trees uh, 10 centimeters and above. Sorry, the one before, um, the kind of the normal way and tooth. Two thirds of the plots, uh, we also measure tree height using a laser and we recorded the species. And then from the species, we use the global databases to, uh, to extract their wood density. And uh, we use the Chave equation to calculate above ground biomass and then above ground carbon. And we sample in total 72,000 trees. And I just want to briefly mention, because I usually get asked this question, <laughs> that the Chave biomass equation was uh, constructed um, using destructive sample of trees, as you may know, which included uh, up to uh, 3,900 meters and some mountain sites in Africa. So it kind of um, 
It's the best out there, even for mountain areas. And what we did is that we compare our findings from the mountains with the Afritron uh, plot network, which is lowlands in Africa, and also to, to the Sparkle and Rigolato uh, plots that they assembled from the other continents, we, together with two recent studies on Venezuela and Colombia, which included both lowland and mountain forests. The next slide, please. So what we found was that the average was uh, 150 megagrams of carbon. So if you remember from the Sparkle and Rigolato paper, that was biomass. So it was 250, which would be roughly 75, um, sorry, 125. So we found higher than in the other continents in the mountains of Africa. And not just uh, higher than the mountains and the other continents, but actually the same average as lowland forests in Africa, which are higher, for example, than the neotropics. And it was, uh, you can see here, the, the, um, although the average was the same, we can definitely see more uh, variation on the mountains. And what is also important to notice is that the IPCC default value for mountain forests in Africa was 89 megagrams of carbon. So our estimate is a lot higher. And the IPCC val uh, value that uh, was available before, combining young secondary forests with uh, old secondary and primary forests, or what we call old growth. So that's why, because it was combining also secondary forests, including the young ones, that's why um, the average was lower. So next slide, please. So uh, first, we were quite surprised by this uh, estimate. So we were concerned that the results were driven by the data that we gathered because we didn't get funding to do this work. We actually, as I said, we assembled plots from different sources that were already existing. So we thought it might be driven by the fact that we assembled plots from different sizes. And um, so what we did with the very small plots that were less than 0.2 hectares, we aggregated them if they're in a nearby uh, location spatially, but also climatically using the uh, data provider knowledge. So sometimes the plots were set up in kind of uh, clusters or something like this. But even if we looked at the uh, unaggregated plots or only the larger plots, there was no difference. So in the, in the mean value, these 150 megagrams of carbon per hectare. So it, it seems that the results were not driven at least by the fact that we were assembling plots from different sizes. Uh, the next one, please. We also looked at uh, it was the way that the plots were set up in the landscape initially that was driving the results. And you can see here where some plots were uh, uh, set up along transects, along elevation bands, or uh, in a random way or more subjective way in kind of a nice patch of forest that is not degraded. And, um, and there was also no pattern on that. So even if the data providers of the initial studies had used different uh, plot setups, uh, that didn't seem to be driving the, the fact that we found this kind of high value. The next one, please. We also looked at if uh, it was maybe just uh, by chance that the plots we, we assembled for the African continent were at different elevations on average than from the plots we managed to assemble from the other continents. But even if we restricted the plots to, to 000, between 1,000 and 2,200 meters elevation, which is where uh, most of the plots for like the majority were, even if we restricted the elevation, the mean value was uh, also not changing and it was not changing also the, this comparison across continents. So it didn't seem that it was just that the fact that we got uh, we assembled kind of lower, slightly lower elevation plots in Africa that was driving the results. Next one, please. We also uh, looked at the relationship between above ground biomass, sorry, above ground carbon and elevation. And this was not significant for any of the continents. But here again, I want you to pay attention that the figure starts at our threshold for what we define as mountain forest or sub mountain forest, which is 800 meters elevation. So from all the plots about from 800 to, uh, um, to up to nearly 4,000 that we got, there was no relationship, but actually the Sparkle and Regalato paper showed that if you include the lowlands plot, so from, if you were to plot this figure, figure from zero meters elevation, it might be different. But here we just plot what we call the mountains and within the mountains, there was no relationship. Next one, please. We also looked at um, if there was the, we were interested in investigating if the environment, certain environmental uh, drivers were um, affecting the, the carbon stocks. 
above ground carbon stocks. And we, we only found two variables that were significantly uh, related to the um, above ground carbon. And this is soil fertility and topographic index. And topographic index means if a plot is located slightly lower than their surroundings, imagine like a little valley, or if it's located in, in higher than the surroundings, so, so more like in a ridge, which in a way in a mountain area with complex topographic terrain might be more uh, relevant than in a lowland forest. And we didn't, I, I mean, as uh, you can see in the figure, there was uh, not really, uh, the environmental drivers didn't explain a lot our, our um, the variation in our above ground carbon. But I want to point out that, of course, the, the data that we gathered is from global data sets like the World Clean, for example. And of course, these data sets are, um, are usually calibrated with few field measurements from mountain regions. So in a way, we know that the, um, the complex terrains in mountains have these small microclimates and, and maybe they're not very well captured by the global data sets that we were using. So probably if we had better uh, climatic data or soil data at the local scale, we, we may see more uh, of an effect in this case. Uh, next slide, please. So we also uh, were concerned about our sampling effort because we didn't uh, go and <laughs> design a, a survey on a way, we just gathered data from different sources. And you can see here in this map is what, if um, is the percentage of uh, mountain forest found in these uh, cells, the darker, the, the more mountain forest. And in the dark in Eastern DRC is actually submountain, as you will see in a map in a, in a minute. But um, and the lighter gray is areas where there are some sub mountain, sorry, sub, some mountain forest, but it's not a lot. So it's, it's probably quite patchy, uh, like small in small hills or things like that. And you can see that um, the pointing up arrows are those that are um, areas where we, we sampled more, we had more plots than it would be expected, given the amount of mountain forest left in those areas. The downward pointing ones is areas where we have less than expected. So this is one area in uh, Ethiopia you can see there. And the circles is area where we have between uh, twice as much or half the sampling effort that we expected. So more or less we are doing fine, except in distant DRC where we are really missing out uh, all these sub mountain forests. But as you know, this area is not so safe. And historically and up to recently, there's been limited scientific research there because of the insecurity. Next one. So what we did was that, um, the next one, please, uh, Yavinder. What we did was to extract the, the environmental conditions of what we call the tropical mountain forest biome in the continent. So, and, and, and also that, and compare that to that of the plots that we gathered. And, and on, in general, uh, if you look at the bottom right figure, our plots, which are the blue lines, were found at high elevations that would be expected from random sampling. Than, uh, because we are missing out this forest in Eastern DRC, as I said, and because they were at high elevation, they were also, they were also cloudier, so they had higher cloud frequency, and that's the center figure here, and they also had lower mean temperatures, which is the top left figure in this diagram. So what we did is that we tried to, to use these relationships that with the, the biome overall and that of our plots to, to estimate um, the, to predict the mean of uh, the carbon uh, stocks in, in tropical mountain forests in Africa, if they had been sampled uh, according to, to the amount of forest left in those areas and their environmental relationships. And what we found is that instead of 150, actually the mean value would be even higher, 176. So if anything, our data set, uh, which is obviously we are, um, under sampling like the Eastern DRC part, if anything, we are actually underestimating uh, the carbon stocks, the mean values. Of course, there's variation across the landscape rather than uh, overestimating. Next one, please. So, so the question is then why the, the African tropical mountain forests have high above ground carbon compared to that in the other continents? And we think the answer is because of the large mammals. Next slide, please. So as you may know, 
um, oh, sorry, I missed one, sorry. So we, we first looked at the structure and, and uh, sorry, the elephant story comes in a second. So what was interesting when we look at the structure of this forest was that it, it was very similar. It was actually not significantly different from that of the lowlands. And as you may know, the, the characteristic of the lowland forest in Africa compared to the other continents is that the stem density is lower so there's about 450 stems per hectare instead of about 600 in the Amazon or in Borneo. So fewer stems, but more stems that are quite big, over 70 centimeters uh, diameter. So the same um, structure was replicated in the mountain forest. So when I said in the beginning that, that we expect fewer of these extremely large trees, actually is not the case in Africa. And now the question comes uh, next. <laughs> Sorry, I mean, the, that's the next one. Now the question is why there are so many large trees in Africa? Next, please. And we think the answer is related to the large mammals that are present in the continent. So um, elephants consume biomass. So they eat the leaves of the trees and they bend small trees as they try to eat the leaves, killing some of them. So in a way they're creating space for those that are already slightly bigger and cannot be bent by them to survive and to grow bigger. So they kind of contribute to the self thinning of the forest in a way. They also uh, disperse nutrients. I mean, they eat a lot of biomass, but they also um, kind of um, poo a lot, if it makes sense. So they distribute the nutrients across the landscape. And in, this might be more relevant in, in mountain areas where the soils have lower nutrients because of this slow decomposition. And also they disperse the seeds uh, of large trees. Many of these large trees have very large seeds and they can only uh, germinate after they pass the digestive system of the elephants. So we think that this might be the explanation why the, the same structure that in the lowlands are also found in the mountains, because in the mountains there's also elephants. So what we did, uh, next one please, what we did is that we, we separated our plots into those that had elephants as, uh, as of 2019, and those that didn't have elephants. And actually we didn't find any difference on the, the mean value. That's the left figure that you can see here. But then uh, we also thought, okay, maybe there might be, this is kind of a compounding effect because there's environmental differences as well and the climate might be different and so on. So what we did is that we separated the, the plots um, with th those with elephants and those without elephants, but by country. So we had five countries where we had plots with and without elephants, Cameroon, DR Congo, Kenya, Rwanda, and Uganda. And in three of these countries, there was no significant difference between the plots with and without elephants. But surprisingly, yeah, or unsurprisingly, two of them in Kenya and Rwanda, actually there were significant differences, but in the opposite direction of what we expected. So in both Kenya and Rwanda, plots with elephants actually had less biomass than those without or less above ground carbon. And we think that actually uh, this figure needs to be interpreted with caution because we only uh, plotted uh, elephant presence and absence and we didn't have data on abundance. So we think that the explanation is that in, in Kenya in particular, but also in the park in Rwanda, that uh, we have uh, elephants in, uh, that we have in this uh, diagram. The, um, the elephants are fenced, which means that they cannot go outside of the protected area, which in a way um, it's good because the, there's been less poaching and the numbers have increased, but maybe the abundance of elephants in these protected areas is not really what you would expect under natural conditions. So maybe the elephant density is higher and therefore the effect these elephants are they are having on the forest is they're consuming a lot more biomass because there's too many. That's why we see uh, lower carbon stocks. But it could also be that, that the, the, the data that we have on absence is also not very correct because we asked for absence of elephants in 2019, but maybe the, um, the absence of elephants, I mean, there's a time lag on the forest structure once the elephant have been removed. So maybe we, we don't really see that yet. Um, because we only, I mean, we would see that in the future. So I think we, or in a way, we think the elephants might still be the explanation. It's just that we, we didn't have uh, detailed information on elephants to really explore these further. And this is something we want to work more in the future. And uh, we also explored if it might be the presence of conifers because for Southeast Asia, that was suggested as the explanation for certain mountain forest types that had more, uh, carbon than others because they had some conifers. And we tried with our plots, but those with and without con 
conifers didn't have a, a difference. And we also try, and we also thought that maybe it might be because there's less steep slopes in the African continent, or maybe the, the mountains have been more ecologically stable. On a way, there's less um, uh, cyclones, for example, in, in, in Africa, maybe except Mozambique. And, um, and also volcanic activity is less than in, in some parts of the Andes or some parts of Southeast Asia. But this is something that definitely requires uh, more, more work and we hope we can continue on that, particularly on the elephant story. So um, next one, please. So what we did is that we, we were wondering, next one also, one more, sorry. Is we, we, we were interested in, okay, these forests have a lot of carbon, but actually how much of these mountain forests are left? And that's, uh, we also investigated that. So we created this map that you can see here. And, and obviously there's a lot less mountain forest in Africa compared with the lowlands because we have this huge uh, Chango lowland forest in, in the Congo Basin. But for many countries, actually mountain forest is most of the evergreen forest that they still have, particularly in East Africa. And what was very interesting that uh, Phil Platt's um, uh, colleague, uh, he also uh, thought it would be interesting to look at deforestation rates. And uh, what he put together was that actually in, in, mon in most countries, I mean, in most of the countries, you can see in this figure, the deforestation rates are higher in the mountains and in the lowlands. And this is the little circles that you see in the diagrams here. So when the purple circle is higher, it means that deforestation in the mountain area is a lot higher than in the lowlands. And um, so we estimated that since 2000, 800,000 hectares of forests have been lost in the mountains, mostly in DRC, in, uh, sorry, one backwards, <laughs> in DRC, in Uganda and Ethiopia. And if these uh, deforestation rates continue, another half a million hectares will be lost by 2030. Uh, Sorry, let me just finish it. Well, I'm about to finish and then I'll take the questions. So next one, please. So um, I, I just wanted to highlight that apart from the carbon stocks, a mountain, a tropical mountain forest in Africa are very important for biodiversity and they have high numbers of endemism. They're also important as uh, water towers for, for the, because they regulate the timing and magnitude of runoff. So I'm sure you heard about the kind of rainforest sponge effect. But also, as uh, many of these forests are cloud forests, they, they collect the water droplets from the, the fog, and that um, contributes to the water inputs in the system. So they're also important, uh, contributed by being a forest, if there was no forest, it would be different in these areas. They also regulate the local temperatures, and they provide many ecosystem services to the local communities, like food, medicine, or cultural services. So, so I think um, the question then comes, and, and I'm usually asked that, um, is that so, so high carbon is actually good or bad news? Next slide, please. And, and I think it's kind of a, a mixed feeling because um, the bad news is that if carbon stocks are higher than we, we thought, by continuing uh, destroying these forests, so by the, the deforestation that I mentioned, we, we calculate and then the degradation, we are actually emitting more CO2 in the atmosphere than we, we thought before. But at the same time, I think it's also kind of good news in a way, or, or it's kind of seeing the, the glass half full instead of half empty, is that because they have higher carbon stocks, maybe they could, uh, there, there would be more interest for, for carbon finance mechanisms that could be help avoid the, the deforestation. And at the same time, many of the countries, particularly in East Africa, they committed to, to the bond challenge, quite a lot of hectares or millions of hectares in a way. So maybe there's a potential to restore the forests that are degraded and, and uh, attain these 150 micrograms of carbon per hectare, which is actually quite high. And, I, and as I said, this is only on the biomass, above ground biomass. We are not. Uh, we are yet to look at the below ground biomass and also looked at the soils, which um, there's. We are trying to. <laughs> we actually wrote the project but didn't get funded. So maybe this is something that we can try to explore in the future. Next one. So I, I just wanted to say I, I, uh, what is next. So we are actually now starting to remeasure some of these plots and. Uh, and uh, I was actually in Uganda uh, recently, and we remeasured some plots there. And there's a colleague remeasuring them in about to remeasure them in Rwanda and in Tanzania, and and slowly and hopefully, of course, during the pandemic, uh, as you know, a lot of fieldwork was kind of on hold. So 
slowly we are trying to, to start remeasuring some of these plots. But as I said, we don't have a big project. So it's kind of every team trying to, to do their own thing. And the idea is to, to try to see if not only they have high, uh, high carbon uh, stocks, but if they're more dynamic and they're still behaving as a sink, or if they're also uh, maybe less um, dynamic and they're actually um, uh, slow growing as we expect in mountain areas in a way. So I think you can just go, yeah, I mean, there's like three or four photos of the field work and I think that's uh, the end. So yes, just the colleagues measuring trees in Buindi. And of course, we also uh, keep dealing with the botany because some of the trees have not been, uh, species have not been studied very well uh, in these mountain regions with endemics. And um, one more, I think. Oh yes, I, I just wanted to briefly mention that sometimes I'm asked, and I'm sure you get the same comments that if your work is really needed, I mean, with all the advances we have in science and, and all the remote sensing products that are out there and the LiDAR and, and the drones and so on. And, and I just wanted to show you this figure that we have in the paper, supplementary material, where we compare the data from, from our plots with four different uh, products, uh, biomass maps used, using different methods at different resolutions. And actually you can see there that the correlation was actually quite low. And this is because uh, using remote sensing uh, approaches in mountain areas is particularly challenging because of the steep slopes and uh, which uh, for example, for LIDA tends to, to overestimate kind of the height. So this is definitely an area where I think field work will be needed still for quite a long time. So uh, yeah, just the, um, the next one, I think is the last one. So I just wanted to say that this is not my work alone. I mean, this is a 101 <laughs> team effort. So there's a lot of people. So we are 101 co-authors in this paper. And uh, there's a lot more people that help students, uh, research assistants, botanists, funders, and facilitators. So I think, um, I mean, it's been a long process. So I got this idea like three years ago or nearly four years now, and it's been a long journey, but I'm, I'm quite happy that at the end we, we made it and we published in, in a good journal as, um, and we got quite a bit of media attention on it. So, so I think uh, on a way it has helped us think that, okay, that, I mean, maybe people are more aware that the lowland uh, forests are important for carbon, for climate, for, for everything, but maybe this has also, um, and hope we will get more attention on the mountain areas as well and where they're less studied as you may know. So that is it, uh, thanks. And I think there's just one more and just I just want to say thanks. I'm sorry that my internet is <laughs> rubbish. <laughs> Hopefully you, you were able to follow and I'll be very happy to take questions. And you can also send me an email if we don't have time to get questions from everybody. Thanks guys. Okay, thank you. Mouse is kind of strange. Sorry, I have a problem with my mouse, yeah. Great, Thank, thanks very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, feel free to we'll move on to the, the Q&A and feel free to switch on your cameras now. Uh, hopefully uh, uh, the internet will stay strong enough for Ida to-, to, to <laughs> Yeah, hopefully I will. But approach. if I disconnect, wait for me, I'll be back. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes. okay, so does anybody want to pitch it, uh, some questions? Maybe there might be something in the chat. Uh, okay, Shiva, you asked one about topograph, topoclimatic variability, I think, Maybe that was covered in the uh, in in the talk. I think I did cover that one. Uh, Kawan, you had a, a question about wood density. Would you like to ask that question directly? Otherwise, I can relay it. Okay, I'll read it out. So, did you investigate the effect of wood density on above ground carbon? Uh, the climate stress imposed on montane forests, the montane, montane forests, may be related to higher wood density and therefore higher above ground carbon. Good question. So I think um, so. I think the challenge is that we didn't measure wood density in the field. So we extracted the wood density from the databases that are out there. So they're not always going to species level. Sometimes they go to genus level because not all the species have studied. So I think there's also a variation in mountain areas. So I think what I learned through this is that we have this idea that, that um, uh, tropical forests are one thing. And of course, as you start working on them, you realize that there are many kinds and they're dominated by different species or semi-dominated in a way. But I think in mountains, there can also be quite different. 
So in the ridges, you may get these short trees and these kind of fairy tale looking forests with the twisted stems and lots of mosses and lots of epiphytes and orchids. And, but in other areas, actually, like in these little valleys or sometimes in the, on the slopes, you get these really tall trees and you would even forget that you are in a mountain. So I think in some areas, yes, the wood density is higher, but not everywhere. So um, I think we tried, I can't remember anymore because we tried so many things with this <laughs> before we came with writing the live version of the paper. But I don't think it was significantly different than the, the lowlands, to be honest. But I can, I can uh, send me an email otherwise and I can just uh, dig for that. But I think it was not different. That's why at the end we didn't include it as a, something relevant to discuss in the paper. Or like, you know, you have many stories in a way we kind of focused on just the high biomass and then they're still getting deforested to try to focus the, the tension of the paper. Okay, uh, and Olivier, uh, you have a question? Would you like to ask it directly? Or... Okay, yeah, thank you very much. So my questions about the different policies that are so many countries in Africa name many parts of the world, where there is this kind of cutting bigger trees, old forest in order to replant, put in new trees, new forests, and seeing the role of bigger trees being the sink of carbon. What do you think about those policies and what, what do you recommend? And the, another thing is, yeah, I was surprised, but there is no relationship with attitude when we measure the biomass. So I was a bit surprised and I was wondering the sampling efforts at different elevations can 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 did it have an impact on this relationship that was in observed? So okay, let me start with the first one. Eh? Yeah. <laughs> so the logging. So I think um in general, because of the terrain that is more complex, there's been less logging in the mountain areas compared to the lowlands. Of course, there are exceptions in like the Tanzania, Uganda, countries that have less lowland forest, then there's been more deforestation in the mountains. And I think it, it is a great point because that's what I always try to explain that, you know, before you focus on restoring the degraded forest, you should focus on avoiding more destruction, right? You should avoid losing these big trees that take hundreds of years to grow before you even talk about planting trees somewhere else. So I think it, it, it is a kind of, I think it's kind of a never ending fight to changing mindsets. So I think there's been a lot of media attention to, to planting trees is good. And of course, planting trees is good, don't get me wrong. I think what we need to also get people attention is that cutting old trees is a disaster. This is like, um, how can I call it? It's like, a, yeah, it's like, terrible because they, they take so long to come back and they store so much carbon. And, and it's kind of, to me, they're kind of a, a legacy. They should be like, um, I know it's kind of our heritage. If we lose these trees, you know, um, yeah, you just cannot replace them back. So I think that there's a, maybe as scientists, we should do more outreach and put more emphasis on getting the message across that first we should avoid deforestation. And then yes, we can invest in restoration. So in places where deforestation is still a problem, we should focus on that one first. So um, hopefully that answered your first point. <laughs> and um, the second one is about the elevation. So here I want to clarify that usually, and of course, uh, as I said, we looked at 44 sites. Eh? So it's uh, quite different sites in different contexts. Usually when you look within one site, so within one mountain, like um, let's say Mount Kilimanjaro, you would see that um, the biomass, uh, the above ground carbon uh, decreases with elevation, but actually in some cases, like in Kilimanjaro in particular, you see a bell case where there's the, what we call the mountain forest type where the podocarpus, where the conifers are that actually have more biomass than higher or lower. So it has a bell shape. But when you put all the mountains together and you have different sites and, and um, everything, then you lose the effect of elevation in a way. You just don't see any correlation or not even the bump shape. And I want to mention that something that is unique or, or maybe more, there's a little bit different in Africa compared to other continents, is that the, the way the mountains are location are located in the continent. So in Africa, you have this very strong effect, what we call the mass elevation effect, which means the bigger mountains are generally warmer because they land just warms up more on a way. So at the same elevation, they are warmer. 
And, and also if the mountain is located further from the ocean, it would have a different climate. So, so I started working on the mountain forest in Kenya and you can definitely see that the mountains that are closer to the ocean, the forest is, starts in a way at about a thousand uh, meters elevation. And in the bigger mountains further from the ocean, at thousand meters, you're still in the savanna zone. There's no forest yet. So I think that's why when you combine different things and you just use elevation, at the end of the day, elevation is meaningless because what is um, important is the climate, how the climate changes with elevation or the soil condition changes or the water logging in the soil or something. So I think that's why you don't really see the effect of elevation as you start to put things together, if it makes sense. <laughs> You're welcome. Great, thank you. Okay, Nikki, you have a question. Hi. Um, Hi. I was just about to, I missed it. I think I did miss it. Um, but you explained why you thought elephants were so important in changing the above ground carbon. Um, and I was just wondering why you thought that. I know you mentioned it, but if you could just quickly recap. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I try. Eh? <laughs> so in, I mean, studies from the lowlands, eh? there's been one measured study and two modeling studies in Africa, or at least this is the ones I found. Eh? And in these studies, they show that elephants uh, uh, have an effect on carbon because of three things. Number one, they consume biomass. So they eat the leaves of small trees. And as they eat some of these small trees, they bend them. So they break them and they die. So they actually, imagine you, I mean, at the end of the day, the resources in the patch of forest are limited, either the light or the nutrients uh, on a way or the space even. So if you kill some of the smaller trees, in, I mean, in this case, the elephant is the one killing them. The ones that are already there and slightly bigger, that's called the medium-sized trees. They can grow bigger now. They have more resources. They have more light or something. So they kind of, um, yeah, by killing some, they, they, they help the others that are already there grow bigger. So that is one thing. The other one is that as they also consume, I mean, not only they consume the biomass, but of course, they also go around and poo it. So they distribute the nutrients uh, across the landscape. And we think that in the mountains, this is even more important because of this slow decomposition in the soils. But we haven't proven yet, eh? but that's the idea. And the third one is also that they disperse the seeds of the big trees. And usually the biggest trees have these huge seeds and they're dependent on elephants for dispersal. So this is a kind of a bit of a longer shot, eh? if it makes sense, but at least the other two are more straightforward. And in the studies that they, they the modeling that they've done, it, that's, that's uh, it seems that, that it's what they, how they explain that if there are these elephants moving around and eating and, and distributing nutrients, they have this effect. But of course, what we found was that there was no significant effect. And in the two countries where we, we have um, uh, in our plots, but of course, uh, there was no significant effect when we put them together. And the for two countries where we, we um, sorry, five countries where we have plots with and without elephants, that so in a way you kind of, taking into account some of these environmental conditions that might be slightly different. Um, in two of them, there were significant differences, but in the opposite direction of what we expected. So plots with elephants had less biomass. But we think the problem is that in these two countries, the elephants are fenced and the population has been increasing inside the park. So maybe the number of elephants is actually not at the... Um, natural balance, if we want to call it like that, maybe there's too many. Of course, this is <laughs> starts to get a bit trickier, but we don't have numbers on abundance, but we just think this might be the reason, but we want to explore it more, but we haven't yet. But that's the, I think that's the idea because to me, it's strange that in the, other, in the only two places where we see this that is significantly different is actually in the places where elephants are fenced and kind of conservation is doing a little bit better. So it's a little bit odd, but maybe as we get more sites, we Maybe the answer is just a non-significant effect, and there's maybe something else that we are missing out. So, yeah, I was, I was, I was wondering. I mean, but perhaps it biased where I come from is I'm mean, from southern Africa, so the forest patches are much smaller, um, and elephants seem to avoid them, especially if they're on a slope. And if they do go there, there's not a lot of food for them to eat, and their impacts are quite low. And sort of they incidentally walk through them. So I was just surprised that, um, but I mean, of course. These, the areas that you're working, the forest patches are much more extensive, I imagine. I think, you know, it's a very good point because I think the first thing I should have said maybe is that 
And this is something we also want to look at. So there's now there are two species of elephants recognized in Africa, the savanna elephant, which is a lot bigger. <clears throat> they go in herds and they have some other whatever differences. I'm not the <laughs> zoologist, but and then we have the forest elephant. And it's so in actually in, in the two places is a good point where we we see the negative effect of elephants, they're actually savanna elephants, not forest elephants. So maybe this is something that we should also look at and, mm, and see. So. That, that's a good point. But I think you, you need to, just to, for you to imagine. So for example, in the Volcanoes Park in Rwanda, where the elephants are fenced, they're fenced in the, in the forest, forest is like the best part because above forest is alpine areas, really high in the valley and vegetation. So for them, this is the best habitat they have. Of course, if they had savanna at low elevation that there was no fence, maybe they would go there. But now they are being confined I don't know for how many years, but definitely for a while into this setting. Okay. So maybe that might be the reason that it's a little bit different. But this is, uh, I mean, a good point in a way that it, it's very different, the setting of a forest elephant. So that's why they don't live in herds because there's less food in the forest as you compare with the savanna. So, so that's, but maybe- It's a fun way to test it with, to go to some of the bigger savanna parks. There's often small patches of temperate forest, Afro-temperate forest. Mm -hmm. in these areas but they're small but then you have comparable elephant densities that you could test it on anyway mm -hmm. yeah no no it's it's a good point this is something that we think that there is a reason there but we haven't gone around it yet and maybe the day we have the bit of that that we see that it was not but that's why it's still a, like an hypothesis at the moment so mm -hmm. yeah i, I likewise wondered how much elephants even forest elephants would, would go into these cold cloud forests especially the, the more upper montane sites and have a significant abundance there but you know, i mean in, even in your own field work and experience did you find elephants at significant uh, abundances in, in the upper montane forests I mean, yes no i mean so i've, I've seen elephants <laughs> and they're scary of course when you're yes, on foot yeah. uh, but i mean just to mention the the site in rwanda that's how i think the, the answer is the abundance because I only measure one plot there, there's six, and I only measure one. And I saw we had to stop for safety to let the kind of elephants walk away. Every day we got in there, I'm like, man, how can they be here every single day? Seriously, this is ridiculous. I mean, I never had that. And I measured forests and trees in so many countries. And there, they're just all over. But I think that is it. It's, it's not that they have many choices. There's not just many, much habitat left to go. So maybe they're just living there all the time. And that's, that's the answer. But mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I don't know, like in, in Kilimanjaro, for example, elephants are only found in the south and slopes. So I think we, we just need to go into more detail about this, like get better that than, I don't know, maybe just have a project putting camera traps in some of these plots and see what's going on. But mm. Great. Jim, darling, you have a question? Yes, good morning, everyone. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Ada. Um, I'm interested in the taxonomic variation that you see in your plot. So uh, there's been a lot of talk recently about our vascular versus sector mycorrhizal uh, communities and how to influence soil carbon, but in many forests, they also influence the basal area of the forest. And so if you have phagales, the oaks and related families, at least I think they contribute uh, to the differences in in montane forest biomass in Central America mm -hmm. and the Northern Andes versus the Central Andes. So it's more of an issue of low biomass in the montane forests in the Central Andes. So what's happening in, in Africa? Do you have many phagales? Um, no. And then also the podocarps <laughs> are fascinating as well, because I think functionally they are rather similar to ectomycorrhizae. So there's some, been some work done in, uh, um, in Borneo by uh, Kanahiro Kitayama um yes, that, that, that shows paper, yes. its effects on nitrogen so so is it all taxonomy rather than than elephants <laughs> no it's a great question and so there's no fagales in africa so that was i tried because i saw the there was i don't know if you've seen it this there's, there's a paper that was published recently from the andes about this and i was like oh i should just try this out no that this is just not an option <laughs> but i think that might also be something that we are and and for the protocarpus that we tried we in Africa, you get the conifers, you get is either podocarpus or afrocarpus. We didn't see it, but also I must say that we we had few plots that were actually where they were actually quite abundant. So maybe this is still something that we're just missing out because of 
the data set that we have on a way. But um, I think the mycorrhiza might be very important. We just don't have very good data on it. So I, I, this is something that I would like to explore more if, if you know yourself or if you know somebody else in a way. Because it's, to me, it would be very easy or relatively easy to just, if we can classify the species and see if there's more of one of the others in areas where there's more carbon or whatever other thing. I mean, of course, the soil data, as I said, we don't see a lot, but it's not great, the soil data we got either. But I, I don't know if, if there's a database or something. So yeah, the data is there. Finally, we put it together. <laughs> we, we check for you know standardizing names and things like that. So I think now there's so much more that we could play with or, or just explore. It's just that, yeah, I, I don't know, to be honest, but I think it is important. We might just be missing out something, yeah. Yeah, I think Adriana Corrales has a paper that came out in New Phytologist a couple of years ago, which kind of delineates mm -hmm tropical ectomycorrhizal families. But I think there's also you know, cryptic, functionally ectomycorrhizal lineages of plants out there that are you know, nutritionally behaving in the same way and may be associated with you know, greater above ground biomass, certainly with greater soil carbon. We just don't recognize them as having a, a distinct mycorrhizal type. I find it unbelievable that the central Andes would lack ectomycorrhizal trees, right? They're so successful in montane forests, mm. many other places. So it's sort of surprising that they're not in Africa as well, given you know how successful they are elsewhere. So no, no, I, yeah. I mean maybe they're there and they're just not very studied, as you say. You know, yeah, we yeah. might just be missing it out. And yeah. and um, because for example, I, I'm, one thing that I always think it's it's interesting is you know you have these patches of monodomin monodominant forest in the lowlands mostly, yeah, like the Gilberto Rendon. I don't know if you heard of, but it, it yeah, forms yeah. huge stands in, in uh, Central Africa. And one of the hypotheses is because of the ectomycorrhiza. So, I mean, maybe there's a lot more out there. We just, it's, it's just a, an area that is not very well studied and we're just missing it out. And... I'm curious, yeah. in what way are podocarps uh, functioning like ectomycorrhizal systems? What, what do they do there? Yeah, well, they, they, they're really weird in that they have these nodules in their roots. And so for a long time, people thought they were fixing nitrogen, but they don't. They house um, arbuscular mycorrhizae within them. Um, but uh, in, um, in Borneo, um, it seems like they are associated with the same sort of reduction in uh, nitrogen availability in the soil that you see below um, ectomycorrhizal stands. Um, and so it may well be that they have other fungi in them. We actually just sent a whole bunch of Podocarpus roots off for sequencing the last couple of weeks. There's another group of fungi called the Mucora mycotina that seem to be like an ancestral group of, of mycorrhizae that are important for nitrogen nutrition. So who knows, maybe, maybe Podocarps are using something like that. Um, so mm -hmm. yeah, there's not a lot of work on them. Just a couple of papers on the mycorrhizae of, of podocarps. But I think the, the fact that they have these nodules maybe potentially allows them to keep uh, their roots uh, infected for longer. It's like a long-term mm -hmm. mycorrhizal support structure on the roots. Um, and in our really wet forests um, in Panama, we see these things climbing up the trees. You know, So if you pull the, the moss off the surface of neighboring trees, you see these podocarp roots climbing up into the canopy. It's really oh, wow. crazy. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Raphael, you have a question? Do you want to give it directly or shall I read it out? Okay. Uh, I'll read it out then. Uh, so you'd like to have more information about the orientation of the plots and whether plots were north or south facing and whether the attitude of the plots affected the biomass content. Sorry, if I got it right. It's the aspect, it's, whether the north aspect. facing or south facing, or how that affects mm -hmm. the biomass. It was, not, uh, it was not significant, but I think this is something also that um, it is important because in, um, so in the study that I, I did initially in, in Kenya, that's how I got the whole idea, their aspect was important. So I think in the dry mountains, aspect is very important. So in, for example, in Kenya, the, the, it would be the eastern side of the mountain. So southeast is a lot wetter than the northwest, the same in Kilimanjaro. So quite a few of these mountains in East Africa that are facing the ocean because the um, moist comes from that side. So you have the, um, the forest types and the elevation where even the forest starts is different. 
But I think in in uh, in the Albertine Rift, so in Central Africa and in the Cameroon Highlands, you don't see that. So I think aspect is important, but as it is not important everywhere, that's why I think when you put the whole data set together, it didn't come up as something significant. But at, at the at the side level, I think that it's of, at least for some sites, it's quite relevant. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, and Nikki, you have another question. Okay, unrelated to your talk. Sorry, I'm just curious. Um, the tropical temperate forests, or oh, sorry, Afro temperate forests, go all the way down to South Africa, and they've got this nice latitudinal gradient. Um, oh, have you noticed any patterns like in the in this grad across this gradient, or is there a reason that like the further south ones aren't included? Are they different forests, or would you consider them all the same? I'm, I'm just no. asking. No, no, no. Great question. Everybody, everybody asks me, why did you miss out South Africa on purpose? <laughs> also, also like no. it's been <laughs> and they've also got some. No, no. Let me explain. Let me explain. So some species are also found there, like uh, Podocarpus in a way, but not all of them. And then we wanted to focus on um, on the tropical mountains, and in a way that it's that's why we exclude it because the it's a little bit different, but. Uh, um, the composition is a little bit different and, I, and I, I, I haven't been there myself, so I should be honest, but I think the structure is also a bit lower. But actually, I, I, since the paper came out, I was contacted by a few people in South Africa wondering why I excluded them and if I can play with some data they have. I just haven't had the time yet, but we are planning that. We just see if it's also comparable to the mean that we come up with. And um, and if not, if it might be that the taxonomy is actually, I mean, I'm saying it's different from what I've read, but I, I don't have the numbers. So uh, in theory, they're less rich, but um, I mean, in terms of diversity, but I, I, we should just explore it in detail. So in our paper, the most south plots that we have was in uh, Northern Mozambique. So we didn't get that far south. But, uh, and sorry, no, and we had uh, Zimbabwe, the mountains between okay, cool. the Manica Highlands. Yes, that, those plots were actually quite diverse in terms of species, but we didn't go south. But this is something, yeah, I, I mean, a <laughs> few people have been it just seems, so It just seems nice, okay. it just seems such a nice gradient. I was just, but I was also just curious if they actually are the same forest or they're separate, you know, they're unrelated um, entirely. Yes, no, some species are the same, as I say, but. Uh, in theory, they're, they're different, but um, yeah, I think they're not very well studied because I know they're trying to, to create a new ecoregion for the mountains of uh, Mozambique and Zimbabwe. So if they manage to get that published and accept it, then definitely they'll be even further away because now you're just going through another completely different ecoregion. So, but yeah, no, it's something that, yeah, I should just, yeah, I should just get the time to to play with the data that I've been given to just see how different they are and, and just see if it's, yeah. I mean, what if they are different, what, what might be the reason, so. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah, it's just, just uh, going back to uh, I think the point you made you talk about uh, other, other alternatives to the high elephants. And I think the one you made about tectonic stability intrigued me as well because uh, if I, my understanding of Africa is more limited, but apart from the Albertine Rift, I think most of the, the mountain ranges are quite old and not very tectonically active, whereas the Andes we know are very active, mm. and the Asian mountains are, I guess, a bit, well, it's a bit of a mix, really, I suppose, there. Uh, and I wonder whether related to te tectonic activity is landslide occurrence and the, the frequency of that, that sort of disturbance. I know from my work in the Andes that landslides are a big shaper of biomass. Uh, the, how frequently a landslide occurs in the landscape, mm -hmm. uh, and I and I wonder whether there, whether there's there's something in this tectonic story that may also perhaps explain. Yeah, no, that's that's actually um, I think that's also something that it's relevant, but we don't have very good data on it on a way, because no. um, so yeah, I, I mean I don't know from colleagues working in the Andes, they always say, oh, but what about the landslides? Are they not that common here? And I'm like, well, they do happen in certain locations, but maybe there's just not that common and of course it's a combination and not just also the steep slopes or maybe the type of soil or maybe the mountains are drier and the, because of the texture of soil there's less prone so there's some yeah there's a couple of areas like Mon Elgon the border between Kenya and Uganda where landslides are 
relatively, everything is relative in a way common and there's more issues about it, but it's not something that people say, oh yes, this is where the landslide was, I don't know, 10 years ago or 20 years ago. I mean, it's not really, I haven't come across as something like that common, but mm -hmm. but maybe that's, um, I guess you've seen that one. There's there's a paper by uh, John Lovett from the Eastern Arc Mountains in Tanzania, and that's why they say that they don't see the pattern of decreasing tree diversity with increasing elevation, just because the mountains are super old, so they have time to evolve and to high speciation in any elevation and no lost in a way. So maybe this is something that applies to to other mountains, and and it's just yeah, maybe it's actually the answer is on the diversity, although there's generally less diverse, the African continent compared with the other continents. Maybe within that limited diversity, there's less changes. And that's why we, we don't see the, the loss of carbon with the elevation as well. I don't know. <laughs> it's be interesting as a variable. I'm sure it would be possible to work out some sort of metric of tectonic activity for each of these sites and then use that to see whether that has predictive power. Yes, there's actually a global map of uh, uh, landslides if I think I found it but then the resolution is quite low and then I was concerned that I mean it's like quite big chunks of uh, squares you know the pixel and I thought okay then in, in that areas where the complex terrain is important then it, is this really relevant I mean I don't think yeah. I can really use it that's why at the end we excluded it but mm. might be interesting as a possible correlation. Yes, yes, no. <laughs> okay we've got a couple more questions great uh, so Wang Li you have a question would you like to ask it Yes, uh, thanks a lot Andy, for the very nice uh, talk. Uh, I, uh, I want to ask that, uh, it, it's really surprised for me to see in your talk that there's a very low correlation between the field measured carbon density and the remote sensing, the remote sensing estimated results. Um, uh, so I want to ask, uh, do you have any suggestions to the people that because there are a lot of big people, big group of people who are working uh, on using remote sensing to estimate the biomass and the carbon density. So do you have any suggestions according to your experiences for this group of people? Because uh, the most available biomass or carbon density products from remote sensing are uh, from different groups. They are produced in different models and at different special resolutions. So, uh, uh, According to your field experiences, do you have any suggestions for us to improve this kind of accuracy, in especially in the mountain areas? Thanks. Yes, no, it's a great question. So uh, thanks for the question, uh, Wang Li. So, so I think um, I think there's no straightforward answer in a way. So, so to my understanding, and I'm not a remote sensing product, I just had to read a lot. <laughs> just, it was actually a comment raised by a reviewer if remote sensing could be used to upscale from the plot level to the landscape and for the other mountains that we didn't sample. And when I looked into it and I was like, okay, there's not correlated none of them. I mean, so it cannot be used. So what do we do then? And I think that's why I say, I think it's a little bit tricky, but probably the, um, the way forward, if we want to be practical about it, would be to, to get more plot data and, and to work with them on a way to, so they can use part of this plot data to calibrate their products. And I was actually in touch with the Jedi team. I, maybe you heard of them. And, uh, and we had uh, like a couple of meetings discussing what would be the answer. And they told me that actually the plot data for them is not enough. What is better is the um, airborne LIDAR. So because then they can, they can have better estimates of the ground level. So that's the problem in the mountain areas that they don't know where is the ground. So they don't know how tall is the tree. So that, because it's based on height, the estimates they're using. So they're overestimating the height or underestimating, particularly if in a mountain, there's like the, um, little cliffs, you know, like little edges where the, the like a big tree is close to an edge. And then it's like, it looks like the tree is 150 meters tall, but which obviously is not the case. So I think it's it's working together, but maybe, I mean, I think my feeling is that for, for uh, mountain areas, maybe you need even more calibration points than in the lowland, just because of this complexity of the terrain and also this variation on the mountain. So, so the message that we came across to, to make the headline for the paper is like high biomass in African mountain forest. But I think another important headline would be high variation, 
because if you look at the variation around uh, the, these mean, it's actually a lot higher in the mountains than in the lowlands for any of the continents. So maybe it's where we actually need more ground measurements. So where um, to really be able to produce better or better calibrated remote sensing products. So yeah, I, I think the products that are out there, they're not great for mountains yet. So maybe we just need to work together and and maybe, I mean, you know, um, acknowledging that what you have is not good it's the first step towards making it better so it's, it's not uh, i mean i don't think it's a defeat it's just another step towards the process you know to improve things so i mean it's, i always say I, I use the wood density database of course if we start collecting more wood samples we also improve the wood density database so i think you can improve things in different directions and they're not exclusive so mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. And uh, so, Jolene, you had a comment on uh, the South African plus. Do you want to make that comment directly? Yeah. Thanks for a really great talk. Um, so, I'm based in South Africa and I've been working on the Afro temperate forest here for a few years. Um, just trying to collect this data. As you say, they're not very well studied systems, um, but we're working on it. Um, so it was just really a comment that most of our forests are quite young um, because most of them were logged during the uh, British colonial era. Um, so most of them are sort of secondary forests. Um, a lot of them are also quite harvested by locals. Um, but for the secondary forest, we're looking at about 80 to 120 megagrams of carbon per hectare. Um, and then we've got a few primary forest patches, but not many, and they were looking at about 200 megagrams. Um, of, so I would, of, of dry biomass, I was just yeah. wondering. So, um, um, yeah, I'll, I'll be in touch with you next week. And maybe yes, I was going to say, I would be very keen, actually, because, I, yeah, as I said, I've been given this data set to play with, but I just really am... I'm, <laughs> I just, I'm completely overloaded at the moment with teaching and some other stuff, so I, I haven't had time. But actually, I would like to get somebody involved like you that knows the area, because for me, it's just a number. I've never been there. I have no idea. I mean, I can just read the paper. But I think yeah. somebody that has kind of a broader vision of if this makes sense or not and why, and just I think it would be great. So yeah, please send me an email. I think that would be great to have somebody yeah. on board. <laughs> That's fantastic. So, great. I see um, the link. <laughs> yeah, thanks. And the value you say about 200 tons of carbon per hectare, Jolene, I mean, that's, I mean, that's substantial compared. compared yeah, to so the, the, those forests are dominated by podocarps. Yes, um, that's what I expected. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> there's, there's some angiosperm seedlings, um, a few in the sort of less than 10 meter height category, but not many, but it's, it's definitely, and you, you see that shift between the primary and the secondary forest. So in the secondary forests, we've got... The only po big podocarps there are the ones that were, for some reason, left by the loggers. I don't know why. Um, but otherwise, they're sort of in the seedling sapling phase. Mm. Um, and that's just dominated by angiosperms. But a lot of those angiosperms are, are nearing the end of their lifespan. A lot of them are starting to fall over. And then we, we're getting the podocarps coming up. So it's, it's really quite interesting just to see that, that mix of The species. dynamics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Actually, it just reminds me of the story of the Andes that we have a number of plots in Chile in the temperate Andes, and the biomass in those plots is phenomenal compared to the tropical Andes, it's two or three times higher. So there's no, at least in the, in the neotropical or the neo South American montane forest, there's no falling off in biomass as you move into the temperate zone. It becomes more coniferous and mm -hmm. uh, gym, uh, gymnosperms rather than angiosperms, but uh, big biomass. Okay, great. So uh, that was a great Q and A. There, lots of really interesting uh, questions and perspectives. So, if no more questions, I think we'll wrap up here. But uh, thank you once again, Ida, for, for, for your uh, uh, for the presentation. And, uh, and behind that, that, that you know, very high impact paper, I think, was phenomenal amount of field work as well. I know how much field work. You did well, you were <laughs> that's right myself, but I think there's a lot of people and that's why I yeah. think I mean I'm grateful to everybody to who made this possible I, you know I, I I did quite a lot myself of course but the, 
I mean, it would not be possible. And I think that's why I always say that collaboration is better than competition. And I, and I know you guys, you, you are on that board as well. But to me, it's still shocking that some people don't <laughs> think that way. So hopefully this is just the beginning of more of these collaborations. So, yeah, yeah thanks. It's a great example of uh, how, how collaboration can yield many benefits. So uh, we have a tradition in this seminar series. If you, if you unmute your microphone, we can give an audible. Uh, applause. Uh, thank you. That, that, that's just a nice <laughs> uh, 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 Thanks again. And uh, thank we'll make you. the uh, recording uh, available online on our YouTube channel and uh, feel free to share it with everyone. Yes, I will. Thank you. Great. Bye bye. Thanks. Take care. Bye bye.